Okay, uh, problem 3.8 is referencing the eigenvalue and eigenfunctions from example 3.1. So just as a refresher, uh, the Hermitian operator that we introduced in example 3.1 was i times d by d phi, where phi is the azimuthal angle, and the corresponding eigenfunction that we associated with this through the example was f of phi is equal to a e to the negative i q times phi, where q is equal to zero, positive negative one, positive negative two, etc., and so on and so on and so on. So uh, this is basically your set of eigenfunctions. We are asked to first check that the eigenvalues for this set of eigenfunctions are in fact real. So remember the eigenvalue function is the statement that this operator q hat, which is what this is, acting on our eigenfunction is going to give us an eigenvalue little q multiplied by, by that same eigenfunction. So easiest way to find q is to operate on this f function with your q hat operator and see what that gives you. So q hat f is going to give me i times d by d phi of a e to the negative i q phi. Or in this case, I could just get rid of the a because I'm not really worried about normalization in this procedure, assuming because we're basically assuming that we can normalize everything afterwards. So let's just get rid of the A and just have this. So uh, in that case, this is going to give me, let's see, this is going to give me I times negative I times, uh, and you know what, actually, it might be better if I re rewrote this as N just to not get it mixed up with the eigenvalue and is the index for your um, for your set of eigenvalues. So let's do that just to avoid confusing it with the eigenvalues, little q. So in that case, the derivative is going to give me negative i n brought down times e to the negative i n phi. I and, neg I, and I make negative 1. Negative 1 and negative 1 make positive 1. So this is just equal to n times e to the negative i n phi. Therefore, your set of eigenvalues is equal to just n, where n, remember, is up here. So this is equal to 0 plus minus one, plus minus two, basically the set of all integers. And obviously that's real, so therefore you're done. Now, part two is gonna tell us to show that the eigenfunctions for the distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. And there's two ways to do this. Um, the first way is probably the way that most of you will think in your head the moment you see this, which is, okay, uh, my eigenfunctions are e to the negative i n phi, right? Where n is any integer. So this is equal to zero e to the i n phi, or e to the i phi for n equals one, e to the negative i phi, e to the two i phi, and so on and so on and so on. These terms are very obviously linearly independent. And assuming that you have the necessary mathematical background up to this point, or maybe you forgot it, which is also fine, we can review, you, you can review it in your own time. But generally, when you're dealing with linearly independent functions, if you take the square integral of two linearly independent functions over sort of any region where they are linearly independent, the result is always going to be zero. So automatically, just by concluding that, you know, these eigenfunctions are linearly independent from one another, uh, you should just automatically be able to conclude that they are going to be orthogonal. Now, if you forget this, you can always just do the hard proof, in which case I would say, okay, I want to prove that the integral from my typically negative infinity to infinity, but remember because phi is the azimuthal angle, we're going from zero to two pi instead, of f star times f dx. We want to prove that this is equal to zero. So let's do that. Integral from zero to two pi of the complex conjugate of e to the negative i n one phi, sorry, I should say f one and f two to represent two different linearly independent eigenfunctions, right? So e to the negative i n one phi star times e to the negative i n two phi, where these are two separate distinct eigenfunctions for this resulting setup right? n1 and n2 can be anything as long as we assume that n1 doesn't equal n2, right? In this case, uh, if I evaluate this out, well, the complex conjugate goes away, e to the i n1 phi times e to the negative i n2 phi. Then taking 
advantage of exponential rules, I can combine these two terms. I get an integral from 0 to 2 pi of e to the i times n1 minus n2 times phi dx. Or I suppose it would be more accurate if I use d phi. My apologies. Had a bit of a brain fart there. So now I can just do this integral, right? This is a very simple integral. This is going to give me 1 over i times n1 minus n2 times e to the power of i n1 minus n2 times phi, going from 0 to 2 pi. In which case, if I want to evaluate this, this is going to give me, let's see, 1 over i times n1 minus n2 times e to the i n1 minus n2 times 2 pi minus e to the just 0, or 1 over i times n1 minus n2 times e to the i n1 minus n2 times 2 pi minus 1. OK. Uh, in that case, at this point, we can start using Euler's identity, right? This is a complex exponential. I can convert it into cosines and sines. So this is actually equal to cosine of 2 pi. Here, you know what? Let me use different brackets just to make things a bit neater. So this is cosine of 2 pi times n1 minus n2 plus i sine 2 pi n1 minus n2. So if I bring that down, this is going to give me 1 over i times n1 minus n2, and then multiplied by this whole thing. So remember, n1 and n2 represent the n index from up here, right? And the n index we just showed is always going to be an integer. So what that means is that n1 minus n2, two different indexes operated against each other, or one subtracted by the other, an integer subtracted by another integer is also going to be an integer. So this is reality. In reality, I can just say that this is equal to cosine 2 pi n plus i sine 2 pi n subtracted by 1. Because once again, n1 minus n2 is some arbitrary integer n. So I can just replace it with 2 pi n, 2 pi n. Now, immediately, the next thing I'm going to realize is, you know, sine of 2 pi n, that's always 0, right? And cosine of 2 pi n, that's always 1. So what I really have here is just 1 minus 1, which is equal to 0. 0 multiplied by this thing is going to be 0. So therefore, this whole thing is equal to 0, which implies orthogonality. And with that, we are done with part A. OK, uh, part B, we're doing the same thing, but this time with the operator from problem 3.6, which for reference is d2 by d phi squared. And the corresponding eigenfunction that we found from this was a linear combination of cosine and sine. So f of phi was equal to c1 times cosine of n phi plus c2 sine of n phi, uh, where n was just equal to 0, 1, 2, so on, so on, so on, so on. So, whoops, I didn't want to zoom out. Apologies. OK, so uh, first off, immediately, uh, what we know here is that sort of, you know, this is a linear combination of two linearly independent functions. And something that you might notice here is that if you apply d2 by d phi squared to either cosine or sine, you're going to get the same sort of eigenfunction. And what I mean by this is if you apply d2 phi or d2 by d phi squared to cosine, right? This is going to give you negative n squared cosine phi, or n phi, I guess, right? Similarly, if you apply d2 by d phi squared to sine of n phi, this is going to give you negative n squared sine n phi. So in both cases, sort of these two different eigenfunctions, we'll call this f of phi, and we'll call this one g of phi, when applied to the same operator, give degenerate eigenvalues. And if you remember back in chap back in problem 3.7, uh, the whole thing that we proved in 3.7 was this idea that in the case where you have right degenerate eigenfunctions, 
any linear combination of those degenerate eigenfunctions is also a valid eigenfunction with the exact same set of eigenvalues. So given that, right, and you know what, just to avoid confusion, I don't want to, I don't want to set this bottom one as f because this is already f, so let's call this one uh, y of v, right? So given that, given that y and g of v are both degenerate eigenfunctions of d2 by d v squared with the same eigenvalue of negative n squared, what that means is that this arbitrary linear combination of, you know, y of phi through cosine and sine of phi through g, uh, or sorry, cosine through y and sine through g, right? This linear combination is also a valid eigenfunction of d2 by d phi squared with the exact same eigenvalue, negative n squared. So because of that, we can just indirectly do this proof without having to apply this onto this larger thing. If you wanted to do it, you could do it and you'll get the same result, right? D2 by D phi squared operated on this thing. You know, there's going to be an n, there's going to be a negative n squared that comes out of the cosine. There's going to be a negative n squared that comes out of the sine that distributes out. Everything else remains the same. The resulting eigenfunction is still negative n squared or the resulting eigenvalue is still negative n squared. You can do that proof yourself. It is very easy. You're just literally applying, you know, two derivatives onto cosine and sine separately. It's not worth me to write out. Either way, the resulting Q is negative n squared. Since n is real and it's an integer, negative n squared is also going to be real and it's also going to be an integer. It's going to equal, you know, 0, 1, 4, 9, and so on and so on and so on. So because of that, we prove the first part, which is that the resulting eigenvalues are in fact um, real. And now part two sort of the same thing happens, right? The, we, we prove it in the same way. Recognize that, you know, because of this, the fact that this proof is a thing, the fact that we can interchange freely between degenerate eigenfunctions and linear combinations of de degenerate eigenfunctions, working with this is effectively the same thing as working with either of these two. So instead of, you know, taking the hard route and trying to do a proof with cosine n phi plus sine n phi, there's nothing stopping me from just analyzing cosine n phi specifically or from analyzing sine n phi specifically. So uh, because of that, and also in addition to that, sort of the same conclusion as part A, right? Cosine of n phi and sine of n phi are linearly independent functions, right? You cannot multiply cosine n phi by any sort of scalar to get it to sine of n phi. They are linearly independent. And because of the fact that they're linearly independent, you should know that taking the square integral of, of them through any range where they are linearly independent is going to give zero. So because of that, automatically, without even having to do any sort of math, you can just automatically conclude, yeah, they're going to be orthogonal. Because remember, once again, when you take the square integral of orthogonal functions, they're going to be always going to be zero. And we showed this with you know dot products as well. If we showed, if you take the dot product of f1 g, if f and g are orthogonal to each other, this is just going to equal zero. You know, go go back to the earlier chapters if you don't remember this, but this is just something that we generally showed. So because of the fact that you know cosine and sine are obviously orthogonal, we don't even have to do the proof. If you really want it to do the proof, right? If you sort of aren't comfortable with this and you want to sort of do the hard math and, uh, and really sort of verify it yourself, you're welcome to. I will give a hint on how to do it. So if you want to do that, integral from 0 to 2 pi, right, of uh, c1 cosine n phi plus c2 sine n phi. Let's change the brackets. star multiplied by and you know what, let's make this n1 and n1 and then c1 cosine and 2 phi plus c2 sine and 2 phi if you really wanted to do this integral out my hint to you uh, is that you want to take advantage of trig identities specifically what you want to prove or what you want the proof that you really want to keep in mind is that sine a times cosine b is going to give you one half times sine of a plus b plus sine of a minus b and similarly cosine of a times sine of b is going to give you one half 
sine a plus b minus sine a minus b. So keep these two identities in mind if you actually are determined to go through this entire proof and do the hard rigorous mathematical proof to show that it is indeed orthogonal. Otherwise, um, hopefully you are comfortable with this idea that if they are linearly independent, they have to be orthogonal. Uh, and with that, we are done with 3.8.